Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Michael Kellett. He's Executive Director of the New England nonprofit organization Restore the North Woods, which he co-founded in 1992. He's been involved in national park, wilderness, public land, and endangered species issues for more than 30 years. In 1994, he developed a proposal for a 3.2 million acre Maine Woods National Park, which laid the groundwork for the 2016 designation by President Obama of the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument in Monia. In Massachusetts, he's worked, to, he's worked to protect Walden Woods and Henry David Thoreau's birthplace and helped develop leg legislation introduced in 2019, which would protect state conservation lands from logging and other development. So first off, thank you for your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So let's start off. Uh, it's called Restore the North Woods. What are the North Woods? Uh, well, the North Woods, are, it's a kind of an ill-defined region. Uh, it depends on where you live. I'm originally from Michigan. Um, people called the North, considered the North Woods to be sort of the western portion of the North Woods. So north, mid, northern, northern half of Michigan and Wisconsin, Minnesota. Um, and then, but in New England, they, a lot of people call it the North Woods too. And, uh, people, so people in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and also in western Massachusetts and the Adirondacks, um, those areas are also technically in the main, the North Woods. And then, uh, interestingly, the other part of the eco region is really sort of the South Woods for Canada because it also, it goes from Nova Scotia to Manitoba in southern Canada. It's all basically a very similar ecoregion in many ways. So we, you know, our, our interest, what we thought is there, there was a lot of, you know, in the 1990s, there was a lot of effort going into protecting ancient forests and protecting, uh, you know, wilderness in the West, in Alaska. There was the, the Tongass and all those things were going on back then, California desert. And there was not much of anything happening in any place in the North Woods, from New England to the upper Midwest. Um, and I happened, you know, having lived in Michigan, I knew that there was a lot here and there uh, that deserves protection. And, and that if we leave these forests, most of it is forested. If we leave the forests alone, they will grow back uh, on their own pretty much. Um, they're pretty, they never were turned into plantations for the most part. So our feeling was somebody needs to, uh, recognize the importance of these forests and educate the public about it and come up with plans and strategies for protecting and restoring, uh, these forests. And that includes the whole ecosystem, including the wildlife, as well as public access and public enjoyment and the, the ecosystem services, as they're called, because um, you know, we don't have that much public land in this region. And so part of it involves buying and protecting new lands as public land. So I, I know this is a pretty big area. You know, you go from Wisconsin to the East Coast, but can you mm -hmm. talk about what the Northwoods were like prior to conquest? Um, were I know okay so maybe in 1989 I I drove up to the Northwest Territories and mm -hmm. um, I saw some old growth there but the old growth in the Northwest Territories the trees were still really small because it's so cold right now I live in the redwoods and the trees are even second growth is still pretty big so were the trees of of Maine and and Massachusetts were they big trees uh, what species um, were predominantly there. Um, just what are some more details on? I know that again, you, you, this covers a big region, but just pick some regions and, and tell us about the forests. Well, what's interesting about this region is um, that, especially the New England portion, it was settled, you know, after 1620, and we don't have much data in terms of what was actually there. It was all, it's extremely anecdotal and non-scientific. And, um, and even self-contradictory. Um, but we do know one of the things that one of the, uh, uh, sayings that you hear, uh, is that a squirrel could, before, uh, pre-settlement for us, a squirrel could have started on the East Coast and gone all the way to Ohio without touching the ground because the forests were so 
dense. And that's actually pretty much true. There were, uh, the estimate is that, uh, in, um, in Massachusetts, for example, which is fairly typical, um, cause it's sort of in, in the middle, uh, the southern edge, but not, you know, the western Massachusetts is not, doesn't have the coastal effect as much. Um, and it, the estimation is that about five or six percent of the landscape was open and all the rest was pretty much closed canopy forest. And you had, um, depending on where you were, there were white pines, some of which got lived, could live 500 years and grow to be 200, almost 200 feet tall. There are some, there's some, uh, white pines right now that have been identified by Bob Leverett, who's an old growth expert that are, uh, you know, 160 feet tall and are huge. Most of these were cut down before anybody, be, of course, before there was photography, before there were any scientific analyses. So we don't really know what we lost. Um, but the, uh, and then you had, um, the, the Northwoods is, is kind of the interface between the uh, southern hardwood, mostly hardwood forests. And then if you go up to Maine or northern Minnesota, it's mostly softwood. It's mostly spruce fir um, forest. So in, in Massachusetts, you have oak, hickory, uh, maple. Uh, there used to be chestnut. Chestnut used to be a major portion of the forest, although not as much as in the southeast. Um, hemlock is is a major uh, softwood species, um, and these are species that are really most of, most of them are pretty. You know, the the, the old growth forest, the trees. You know, they weren't like the California redwoods, but they lived pretty long, and um, the forest was pretty stable. You did because it's so you have so much um, uh, pre precipitation and humidity. Um, you don't fire is really not much of an issue here. It never was, um, other than when settlers came and cleared all the forest and left all the all the uh, so-called waste and that burned. But um, the main shapers of the you know the creators of openings in the forest were beavers, which would create uh, you know beaver impoundments, uh, you know things like ice storms and and wind storms and hurricanes. Um, and um, those were the major forces on the pre-settlement landscape. Along the coast, uh, especially, you would have major hurricanes and storms, which would, like Cape Cod, uh, had a lot of disruption. Um, but mostly it was an interior forest, and so you had uh, species that, that like stable interior-type ecosystems. We, there were wolves. There were, um, in the northern part, there were car woodland caribou. Uh, there were lynx, which we, which have come back and are, uh, the rivers had Atlantic salmon, which restore the North Woods, uh, petition to get listed as an endangered species. And that happened, although it's still, they're still not exactly in great shape. Um, the, the rivers are amazing. There's the, these incredible rivers throughout the region and they used to have amazing, uh, aquatic life. That's been greatly corrupted by introduction of alien species and overfishing and pollution and dams. Um, so, but the, the amazing thing is that, um, the, the forest is so resilient, um, because of the soils are really fertile and there's a lot of humidity and precipitation and not really cataclysmic storms very often or, and you don't have like giant wild wildfires and so forth that you had a pretty stable ecosystem. And that's what uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, even more so, that's why it has such high biodiversity. And in the biodiversity, the native biodiversity in New England um, is particularly high. Um, and uh, also the, the forests in uh, southern New England are, are some of the most carbon-dense forests in the United States. Not as much as the Pacific Northwest, of course, um, but uh, more than most of the forests in the south, uh, in the Rockies, the southwest, um, because, because of these conditions. And even though the forest, uh, most of the forests were, were mowed down by the early uh, 
to mid 1800s. So Henry David Thoreau, uh, when he lived in Concord and wrote about what he saw around him in almost the entire landscape was totally open and farmland and, and pastures and so forth. Now you look around, it's almost totally the, the part that doesn't have houses and, and development is pretty much closed canopy forest. And even where the houses are, most people let the forest grow, the trees grow. So um, this forest has had this amazing comeback. And the same is true in the upper Midwest, um, it, although the cycle is different because, the you know, the logging started basically the beginning of the industrial forest, uh, industrial forestry was Maine. That was where they, re you know, these these rich guys in Boston bought up land in northern Maine because Maine was sort of a cut was basically a colony of Massachusetts at the beginning. And they would buy these big chunks of, of forest and just, you know, for like a dollar an acre or some five dollars an acre, ridiculous price. And there were no regulations, no nothing. And they did these river drives and they just mowed down everything. And Henry David Thoreau, again, when he was up there writing the book, The Maine Woods, he was that was the beginning of the end for the native forest up there. But then when they mowed down, you know, they, the industry cut all the forest down in the Northeast, they moved West. And so then they moved to Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota and did the same thing there, but it took them a while. So the forests there are, are further behind in, in the cycle in Massachusetts and most of Southern in mid new England, the average tree, the average forest age is about 75 to 80 years old. There are really not very many trees more, over 100 years old. Um, there's per virtually no old growth. It's like one-tenth of 1% 1 of New England. The Adirondacks has a couple big chunks of old growth of uh, totaling, I think, about 100,000 acres um, in New York. But that's uh, that's about it for the Northeast. So we're talking about virtually all second growth forests. But again, it grows back so fast. Um, if we, for example, Baxter State Park in Maine and the for in Maine is, is, you know, that's more northerly. So you're, you're talking about smaller trees and slower growth and, um, shorter season. It's like northern Maine is like the upper peninsula of Michigan or northern Minnesota or northern Wisconsin. And, um, but Baxter State Park in Maine uh, in, includes Mount Katahdin, which is the tallest mountain in Maine. It's it's a mile high, which uh, from Western standards doesn't seem that high, but it, but the the base of the mountain is almost at sea level, so it's actually quite a quite an elevation. And uh, the former governor Percival Baxter bought land from these paper companies, which had ended up with the land after the biggest trees had been cut down um, around the turn of the at the end of the 19th century. And Baxter bought this, started buying this land in the mid, you know, 1930s because he believed Mount Katahdin and the forest around it ought to be protected for the public. And there was talk of a national park up there, even back around the turn of the century, actually. Um, but he ended up buying land, mostly cut over land from the paper companies. And, Today, if you go there, or if you, and if you fly over it, uh, you would not know that just on a cursory view that this wasn't an original forest, that this forest grew back because it's so dense and lush. Um, so it, it shows how amazing, I mean, this is less than a century old, this park, and it looks, it's incredible. So, so what we said is, look, you know, what the, the big missing piece in, in this region, is there's practically no public land. In Massachusetts, about 11% of the land is in public ownership, almost all state. Um, Maine is about 5%, I believe, 5 or 6%. Um, the Adirondack, New, uh, the Adirondack is, is a big chunk, so New York has a, a bigger percentage, but still not very much for such a big state. And so our feeling was now's the time when this forest is coming back. What's going to happen is these companies are going to come and they're going to mow it all down again. And now they're going to do it for biomass and for wooden, wooden skyscrapers and for whatever crazy stuff, uh, they're going to, they can make money from and they're going to build, uh, a lot of these, uh, forests have just 
zillions of small lakes and ponds. Maine has thousands and thousands of small lakes and ponds. Um, and th those are going to, you know, eventually they're all going to get surrounded by, by camps and cottages if they, if the land is not protected. Most of it is in private or corporate hands. Um, so our feeling was if we protect these lands, and this is the same with the upper Midwest, upper Midwest has more public land. Michigan has, uh, about 2.7 million acres of national forest and, um, you know, the superior national forest in Minnesota is three million, three million acres alone. And Wisconsin has cut, uh, I think a million and a half or so. So you got a lot to work with. And there's a lot of state land in all these states. So we got a lot to work with, but there really was not much. When I, uh, moved from Michigan to, uh, to, uh, Massachusetts to take over the Boston, the New England office of the Wilderness Society, they hired me because all the people who, all the people who thought that the West was the place to go if you wanted excitement, they, there's all this public land, you know, there's nothing really to save in New England, all the wilderness is out West, who wants to go there? So they hired me because I was, I was an Easterner, well, a Midwesterner, and I knew something about places without a lot of public land. So here we come here, and the first thing I do is I'm looking around and I'm going, wow, there's incredible potential here, but nobody knows about it. Nobody's, these forests have been devalued. The, you know, the term working forest, which is just a, a, a weird, sick concept that started in, as far as I can tell, with the main paper companies to make their clear cut wastelands sound appealing and hardworking. Um, now that term is used all over the place, including by conservationists. And they talk about working landscapes and it's just a totally bogus utilitarian exploitative concept. It's not working unless you're cutting down the trees and grazing it and mining and tracking. And so, um, but our feeling was that the, this region is pr pr politically very progressive overall. So here you've got a pr uh, population of people who are potentially open to protection, but don't really know, they don't really know what a real forest even looks like for the most part. They don't know what the op opportunity is. They don't know how to do it. When we talked about doing a national park in Maine, nobody even knew how you did created a national park. It was just, just this generic concept to them. So uh, that's what we've been working on this whole time is basically changing people's view of what we have and making them appreciate it and coming up with real life strategies to to protect permanently protect areas rather than being on the endless defense, which is what most conservationists around the country are now, is basically on defense almost the whole time. And we never have any permanent protection, per large scale, uh, restoration. And, and, you know, we always have these compromised halfway measures. And, and our feeling was let's do it right the first time here, or, or I should say the second time we got a second chance here. Let's do it right this time instead of uh, halfway measures like, uh, like we've seen so much. Well, I think that's fabulous. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, there's a bunch of different directions we could go. And before we go forward, I want to, I want to step back to what the forest was like and ask a couple more quick questions about that. And then we'll jump. Mm -hmm. into the present. Um, and these are pretty ignorant questions. Um, you said that chestnuts only came up so far. So that makes me wonder, were passenger pigeons that far east i know they were all over michigan oh yeah so yeah they were here yep again no this was not prime habitat for them this is sort of the uh northeastern edge so they you know you didn't have the gigantic uh flocks like you did in the midwest and, and in ohio and southern michigan and so forth that was probably the core habitat area at the time they, they you know because much of new england in the north woods doesn't have a lot of hardwood and chestnuts sort of a, you know, mid, middle, uh, range hardwood that, that doesn't like super cold or didn't like, doesn't like the ones, there are a few left <laughs> here and there. So, so no, the passenger pigeons there, they were here, but it was not a, a huge, they were not a huge part of the ecosystem like they were in some other places. Okay. So I have two more questions before we jump back to the present. One of them is, uh, what about uh, wood bison? Were they that far northeast? There were, as far as we know, there weren't any bison this far east. There were bison in Pennsylvania, 
um, and I believe in east in western New York. Uh, but they, you know, they basically uh, only went as far as there were any significant grass, grassy or meadow areas. Um, and so, and New England and the north, most of the north woods never had any large open areas. So, so who were the they, large ungulates? Uh, moose or, or moose, uh, caribou in the north. Um, that you have, of course, deer, but the, the, the deer. This is uh, Maine is sort of the northern edge for them. Massachusetts had deer. They were not as common as they are now because of all because of the clearing and so forth. But yeah, deer. Um, the, you don't have you didn't have the large number of, of large ungulates and uh, prey species like you have in the West. Um, there were wolves. There there were uh, of course fox and bobcats and Fisher and Pine Martin to the north, um, Beaver. Um, so wolves eat. Wolves ate deer. They eat beaver. They eat foxes. They eat uh, rabbits. They eat. You know, there there was a lot of uh, lynx, um, bobcats, when they could get one. Moose. In fact, uh, moose. Um, were uh, pretty almost extinct in the in the Northeast from hunting. Uh, they have come back now to the. There are like fifty thousand moose in Maine. There are more moose in Maine than any place else in the lower forty eight states. In fact, and it's because there are no wolves to keep them in check. I mean, uh, uh, pr predators don't, as we know, as as. Anti-predator people will say they eat all the wildlife. We know that's not true, but they do help to keep populations somewhat in check. And so without – we have coyotes that came in after the wolves were killed off. And But they're not as big they're, – they're bigger than western coyotes, and some people think they've been hybridized. Um, and they will eat uh, deer, although they usually go for smaller or sick deer and not a not – a, you know, full grown buck or, uh, but, and the same with moose, they can, they, uh, if, you know, they'll go after young moose or whatever, but generally not, they can't take down moose. So that's a problem. And, uh, people don't know about predators in this region. So there's, it's interesting. It's not like the West where you have this ingrained real, real hatred for predators in certain demographics and you don't really have that so much here it's more sort of this fear of the unknown kind of thing so actually it's possible to get people interested in those sorts of issues here well that brings up another question again sorry before we move forward mm -hmm. to the present. um what what are the possibilities for wolves either how 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 close are the closest wolves i know that they're in um minnesota and wisconsin and i think up um, yeah. What's how much would it take? I know wolves. There were wolves came down. There are now wolves in either in or close to California, and that's a long mm -hmm. way from the Yellowstone area. Right. So they make their way. What's what's the possibility of wolf either uh, reintroducing themselves or being reintroduced? Well, when we lived in Michigan uh, in the until the 1980s. I worked on Michigan National Forest planning. That was the first round of National Forest planning. And I, my job was to read all the three national forest plans for Michigan and comment and prepare administrative appeals because they were all horrible plans. And, but one of the concessions we got, uh, in the Hiawatha National Forest, which is in eastern Michigan, uh, the eastern UP, um, was to designate wolf, uh, lynx pine marten areas which would be, they weren't wilderness, but they were, you know, basically like uh, semi-primitive non-motorized or semi-primitive motorized with just some dirt roads. And, and of course, people said, oh, there aren't any wolves up here. What are you talking about? They're never going to come back, blah, blah, blah. And we said, well, fine, if they don't, they, you know, there are other wildlife that will enjoy this. So they, so they didn't, they thought, oh, well, it's, you know, there aren't going to be any wolves, so who cares? Well, guess what? The wolves... Uh, uh, you know, about 10 years later, the wolves were coming back. They were coming from 
was from Wisconsin uh, or through from Canada. They could there there are ways they can get across from Canada, but mostly through from Wisconsin. And now there are enough wolves in Michigan that it's you know the, it's just like it is in the West where these idiots want to hunt them. And um, in fact, I I believe it's kind of gone off and on, but I think they have a wolf hunt now. Uh, so they went from having no wolves at all. They had tried introducing wolves back in, I think it was the seventies and they introduced like four and they were shot and run over. And so they were quick, very quickly killed, but then they came back on their own. So now there are a lot of wolves in the upper Midwest, although not, you know, nothing like it should be nothing like it was pre settlement, but still, uh, they have reestablished themselves. In New England, there are no wolves, at least no, no official wolves. And, and part of the problem is that they're too far away. They're up, there are wolves up in uh, the Algonquin Park in, in Ontario, but that's about uh, 80, 70, 80, 90 miles north of uh, the border. And in between is the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is always, you know, they, they, break the ice in the winter so it's rarely frozen over so they really they have a hard time getting across that and then when they do you've got north of the border in you know northern new england's all this remote forested area you go across the border into canada it's farmland because that's southern canada so you know they get mowed down by farmers or poisoned or whatever so it's a gauntlet to get from there to northern new england and the same with the adirondacks um, the, the thing is though, there's incredible habitat. Northern Maine, if, if you, if you dropped a bunch of wolves in Northern Maine, like they did in Yellowstone and didn't sh- kill them, they would just go crazy. You've got moose, deer, lynx, but bobcat, you know, you name it, beaver. Um, it would be incredible habitat, millions of acres with no cities, no, no towns. I mean, Northern Maine, has these unorganized townships, which are, have, we're, it's like Alaska. Alaska has unorganized townships. There, there's no government, no local infrastructure, no, it, it, these companies, base, it's basically privately owned little fiefdoms. And, and they didn't want towns up there because they wanted to log it. So it's this huge area with no people, no development other than a few, you know, you got logging roads. It's like a giant, National forest, even worse managed than a national forest, if that's possible, but sort of like that. And so uh, it's totally possible to to recover wolves in this region. It, we, you just have to – it's just political. It's a political issue. Well, that's one of the most exciting things I've heard in a while. Thank you for telling me about that. And one more question before we go to the present, which is I'm thinking about undergrowth. And, you know, I just don't know, and I'm guessing listeners, a lot of them won't know. Um is, are, are these are the forests there when they when they do get to be pretty healthy? Are they more open type forests like where I grew up in Colorado, or is it like here where when Jedediah Smith came through, he was going like three miles a day because the undergrowth is so thick. Right. That's that's basically how most of it is. There are some areas with uh, that are, have sandy soils. And and are somewhat fire prone, and and that's a, in the Midwest there are jack pine plains they call them that are similar. Here there's pitch pine and oaks, um, so there, those areas do have some open, you know, naturally open uh, landscape. But most of the area, it you know, it's so the soil so fertile and there's so much moisture that you can't stop stuff from growing. So if the for in an old growth forest though what happens is you end up with enough shade eventually that there is undergrowth but it's not so b- bushy that you can't get through it depending on what kind of uh canopy you have like like um white pines tend to really in in hemlock you get a lot of shade so those those forests don't have as much undergrowth although again they do uh it's not like an open savanna type thing but um but your average any you know like the forest if i if i went to a you know a local forest there's a park in our town here 
you go there and you walk off the trail and it's just dense, every, you know, everything. Now, it, but it, eventually, uh, part of it is there's no old growth. So um, you're seeing, we're seeing these mid mature forests. Um, but it's not, but again, it's not, it's not like, you know, I've been to California with the chaparral and sort of uh, open savanna. You don't have anything like that here anywhere. Okay, let's jump to the present. Um, and thank you so much for that, for that uh, tour of, of the East um, and the Northwoods. So uh, can you talk about uh, 8897? Mm-hmm. Uh, H897 is a bill in the Massachusetts legislature, which I helped to write. And uh, the reason we did it is because um, – Massachusetts, about 10, 11 percent of the land base in Massachusetts is is state land. And this was land that was just like most eastern uh, public lands. It was mainly from tax reversion when farms went out under during the 1930s or from uh, public acquisition when the landowner, you know, again, when they were tired of farming or didn't didn't or went broke or whatever. And these lands have been acquired over the years. New England never had any public land, public domain land like the West. As you probably know, when the uh, the original 13 colonies, and basically until we got to Minnesota, uh, the concept was give away all the public domain as quickly as possible or sell it for nothing because that's destiny. That's manifest destiny. And... Um, but when we got to northern Minnesota and then to the, you know, to the Rockies, people started to go, wait a minute, hmm, wait a minute, maybe this isn't such a totally good idea. Maybe we ought to keep some of it. Um, and but here we didn't have that. So all the so this 11 percent, it st- started with zero percent public land. Um, but it's but and, and so you end up with patchy uh Chunks of land. Um, the biggest single, interestingly, the biggest single piece of public land in southern New England is the Quabbin Reservoir uh, reservation that surrounds the Quabbin Reservoir. The Quabbin Reservoir is about 25,000 acres. That was, uh, I won't go into the story, but it was created in the 1930s to, because Boston was running out of water supply, so they dammed this river and flooded four towns, bought out the people, evacuated these towns, and flooded this whole valley. Um, but it's been called an accidental wilderness because what they did is they bought up 80,000 acres eventually around this reservoir, or I should say, including the reservoir, 80,000 acres, so it would be, what, 65,000, whatever. A lot of land was acquired to be a buffer for this reservoir. So um, and they didn't allow any towns or anything like that. So you had this this reservoir in, in uh, this Quabbin Reservoir. It's it's the size of Jackson Lake. It's the same size as Jackson Lake in in Grand Teton National Park. So it's big, and it's and it's surrounded by undeveloped forest. However, they you know they as the trees started to grow back because it was really, it was farmland when they bought it pretty much. When the trees started growing back, of course, the forest products industry and said, oh, well, useful forest resource. Let, we need to cut these trees down before they become overmature and decadent. And so they started logging in there. And then more recently, th- these foresters who thought that they were scientific in their approach said, oh, no, we need to log it because it's going to because otherwise we'll have a hurricane and it'll all blow down and it'll all rot and and it's going to pollute the reservoir and whatever. But we, if we keep them as these thrifty, young, vibrant forests by logging all the time, then we'll avoid that. It's a total crackpot, un, un, scientifically unsound, unproven concept. But this whole this is being done in reservoirs all over in the east. This logging supposedly for water quality. It's bizarre. It's really crazy. Um, it's like the Bull Run, the whole Bull Run thing. What was that outside of Portland? where they were logging in this, it was old growth, but they were logging around this reservoir, and finally they, it was stopped by public pressure because it was so stupid, um, and it was degrading water quality. So anyway, the, the point is we have these public lands, but they're totally not appreciated by, they're, they're managed by these 
these, you know, it's like being managed by the for U.S. Forest Service. It's the same mentality. They just see it as the, the resource and timber and, you know, we need to, to, we've got even age stands, so we need to, we need the various stand diversity and blah, 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 forest health. And, and they've got this new concept of we need to log for early successional wildlife because we don't have enough openings anymore. So that's another reason to log. And, and what's happening is that, you know, more and more people, uh, these, their state forests and state parks scattered all around the state. And, and, you know, Massachusetts is one of the most densely populated states, although most people are crammed into the Boston area. So actually, if you go outside of Boston, it, it does not seem like it's super densely populated. So you have a lot of open space and people, so people go to these areas and they're starting to realize that they're logging these forests. And just like with national forests, most people don't know they're logging national forests either. Um, so people started raising a stink about this, and I got involved uh, in 2009, I think it was. Here I'd been working on saving the Maine woods, and, and here they're trashing these forests right nearby. So I got involved, and there was a push to increase protected areas, reserves, or parks, um, and they did, the state did do that to some extent, but they went right back everywhere else. They went right back to the same old industrial logging and people were getting more and more fed up. There are more and more people, uh, trying to fight it. Uh, there's really no good legal, uh, way to do it because the state laws are, were written that the major state law determining the goals of state forests or state lands, it was written in 1943 during World War II. When, you know, we need timber for the war efforts. Better, you know, do we, what do we, we don't know if we're going to survive. We need these trees where we can't just leave them sitting there. You know, that's the law. So we said, let's change the law. So instead of encouraging logging, let's change the law to, 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 to require protection of all state conservation lands. That's 610,000 acres. So that's like twice the size of almost of Grand Teton National Park. That's a pretty good size area. So um, so we wrote this law that basically gets rid of all the forestry and logging and forest management, all that stuff from the state laws, and, and recognizes the highest value is, is uh, biodiversity and carbon sequestration for climate change and public recreation. And so we got this. This bill was introduced in the legislature, and it's pending right now. Um, we have about 15 co-sponsors. Um, we'll see what happens. The, the, the usual suspects in the, uh, are opposing it, of course. Perversely, uh, the, t- the timber industry, of course, supports it, but they're not very big in Massachusetts. They're not, it's nothing like in the West or even the upper Midwest. They're really fairly small. It, the, one of the big problems is, is we have uh, conservation organizations and we have academic, uh, academics from University of Massachusetts who say, no, no, we can't turn those into preserves because we have to log them for wildlife because all these birds are going to go extinct if we don't log. So you have conservation organizations opposing protection because they want to log supposedly for wildlife, which is totally bogus. I've been looking into it. It's really just a total, totally misguided concept. So, but anyway, we'll, we'll see where we're, people, when they hear about it, they're very interested. Most people don't even know about what's going on and they hear about the the possibility and they go wow this really sounds cool so we have a, a, a petition online uh, for a moratorium on logging hopefully until this bill passes um and we're getting people organized and fired up and so we'll see um so we have about 10 minutes left and first what what actually what what does h897 um what is it and what does it do? Does it prohibit logging on these state lands? What's the what's the what's what, what does it actually do? What it did what it does is we we stole the language directly from Adirondack Park language, which was from eighteen ninety four, which which says I can't remember the exact terminology, but it's basically in public lands in the Adirondack Park, you can't trees cannot be destroyed, removed uh, cut, whatever. So you can't cut trees, period. 
It's not you can't do commercial logging. It's you can't cut any trees. But there's an exception if you can scientifically prove it's needed or historically that it's needed for public safety if a tree is going to fall on a campground or if if there's some oddball species that somehow like a butterfly needs an opening created artificially because they'll go extinct that's allowable but it basically says you can't do it unless we unless you can show that it's necessary um so it's basically like a national park in that way is the way it would be or like Adirondack Park in New York. So it's, it's, um, that's what the bill would do. It's, so there's, there would be no logging, no, and it also bans pipelines, po- uh, clear cut solar arrays, wind power arrays, anything that cuts down trees, you can't do it. So this would be, as far as I can tell, this would be the first state that bans all logging and other extractive industry on all of its state conservation lands. This doesn't include, of course, highway, you know, rights of way or whatever, but all conservation lands that are meant to be open space. I, I don't know of any other state that has this kind of protection. They all allow resource extraction on, on much, if not all, of their lands. So what place better to start than revolutionary Massachusetts where we – We like to buck the system. (laughs) Um, So there's a whole other topic, proforestation, that I I want to talk about in a moment to sort of – but before then, can you spend like two minutes uh, rebutting the uh, birds need logging argument? Can you first make their argument and then rebut it very quickly? Well, the argument is uh, that that there are a bunch of birds – that are that are rapidly declining in population, and it's and it's been happening very quickly, and it's because uh, we we've been suppressing fire and and other disturbances, and we don't have we we don't have enough open space for these species. They all they need earth, you know young forest or shrubland or meadows or, or grasslands, and so unless we artificially create these areas. They're going to run out of habitat, and they're going to—they could go extinct or or be on the verge of extinction. That's the argument. Um, my rebuttal is number one: nobody knows what the pre-settlement populations of these species were. Number one. Number two: the almost all of their arguments are based on populations from starting in 1966. Now, that not very many people know what happened in 1966. That was the that was when the breeding bird survey first started, which was the nationwide survey that all, almost all bird populations are based on that survey. Before 1966, there was nothing. The, the only thing, the only scientific, they, they looked at game species and they looked at mammals. And there's no reliable data before 1966 on anything else. So they are basically, it's like the, the weird, the you know the the weird thing with climate change where they started in 1998 which was a super warm year and then they showed you that actually the globe's getting cooler it's the same thing they have these graphs you look at the graphs on any of the websites where they talk about the need to log for wildlife they all start in 1960s in the 1960s and that's why so that's number one and so it's all speculative this is all speculative based on you know and uh, the other thing is a lot of the species that they're talking about are not even native. For take Mass, I'm focusing on Massachusetts. They're not even native to Massachusetts. They moved in because they cleared all the forest away. <laughs> so what we have is basically we had this huge spike in population of these species when when almost all of the forest was wiped out. Now the forest is growing back, and the and the populations are going back to normal. And, you know, they talk about fire suppression. There was hardly any fire in New England. It was not a major factor at all. On the coast, there were some because of the, you know, sand sand plains. They talked about, oh, the Native Americans lit all kinds of fires. That's There's no evidence that that's true. That's totally speculative, anecdotal. Um, and they say, oh, beaver, they, you know, they killed all the beaver. Well, the beaver are back. There are all kinds of beaver. So anyway, I... And the other thing is we have an un, a totally uncontrolled experiment because what is the baseline 
that they can measure success or failure of this logging for wildlife against? Where is the natural ecosystem, natu large natural areas, which would have the whole range of disturbances and natural processes? What, what are they measuring against? It's a big, giant, uncontrolled experiment. They're just going on logging. They don't know what they're doing. It's They totally don't know what they're doing. So, you know, if they want to do this in a few areas as an experiment, fine. But don't take our public land and hack it up to supposedly to help wildlife. Well, Sorry. I, apart, so anyway. Apart from which, if, if they need sort of shrubby forests, instead of taking growing native forests, um, convert some farmland or some – how about a parking lot? How about converting those into shrubland? All right. And the other thing is there's plenty of early successional shrubland and stuff. It's tough. All you have to do is drive around the region. I mean, it's I don't I don't know what they're basing their numbers on, but there's plenty of early successional habitat all over. And they could do it. Yeah, they could pay a farmer to, to keep some area open, you know, whatever. I mean, it's it's just a it's a it's really a specious. The whole thing is specious. I don't think the people have bad intentions, the pe the biologists at least, but the U the forest industry has you know grabbed onto this and they of course foresters they have foresters for the birds. What a joke. Foresters for the birds. Oh yeah, they're only doing it to help the birds and their pocketbook. Yeah. So we I mean, it's, we have just a, we have just a couple three minutes left. Yeah. And we have a very important topic that we haven't right. heard yet. Which is, can you just give us give us three minutes on proforestation? Well, proforestation. Interestingly, the people who wrote this paper, uh, which people should read, I know these people, and they, we all talked about this, and and we all talked about the fact that here we're talking about for saving forests for uh, climate change and biodiversity, but it's almost all about reforestation of areas that have been mowed down forests that have been mowed down and letting you know helping them grow back or afforestation which is areas that maybe never had forests they never talk about just leaving forests alone and letting them grow back on their own isn't that weird i think it's because the forest industry doesn't want that and and uh so they they think oh reforestation there's a role for us to actively you know, reforest and also afforestation. There's a role for us to plant trees, but but leaving forests alone, we don't want to do that. And so, proforestation, they had to invent a term, proforestation, for which is basically leaving forests alone, letting them grow back, letting them be mature. Don't log them, don't develop them, don't mess around with them. Just let them return to being natural forests. And that's the concept. That's basically what we're putting in place with H897. We're saying let's do proforestation on all the state lands, let them grow back, and then don't log them this time. Leave them alone and protect them. And we could do that across the country. There's, you know, of course there are places where there are uh, giant uh, plantations in the southeast or whatever, but most of the region, like the upper Midwest, the whole region, it, you could let that all grow back. Um, you could do this on huge parts of the, of the country. And but but there needs to be a conscious policy to do that. Right now there isn't for the most part. It's bizarre, but it's you know you, you read the UN stuff, you read any of the international, none of it talks about the natural uh, climate solutions paper. They don't talk about this concept. They talk about everything but. So so anyway, I it it makes so much sense. It's the kind of thing you go oh oh well of course. But they had to invent a word to, to describe this. So it's really cool. I, I really think I, I hope it catches on and people start to realize that this is a great strategy for climate change and biodiversity. If you leave a forest alone where I moved here, um, some of the trees are pretty big and then there was a lot of dog hair. And even in the last 20 years, there were some some people came in and were like, yeah, you got to clear it out, thin it out. It's like, no, um, the trees will thin themselves out. Right. That's happened. Some of the dog hair has died and it's opening up and that's forests know better than I do how forests should be. Right. Right. And the only the only forest ecosystems that we know of that actually really are permanently self-sustaining and healthy or whatever are national parks and wilderness and places we haven't messed around with. Those are the only places that where we have hundreds and thousands of years of 
sustainable, self-renewing ecosystems. There is no place on the planet where there's been perpetual human uh, manipulation and so-called management that is healthy and self-sustaining and ecologically diverse. There's no place. Where is it? There isn't any place. So, you know, if you want to talk about track record, I would take Yellowstone over some working forest in northern Maine any day of the week. So the last the last question here is how can people help um, either people in your region or people out of your region? How can they help either with H897 or how can they help the Northwoods in general? Well, uh, in terms of 897, if they, people don't live in Massachusetts, they probably aren't, aren't going to be able to do much. Although uh, writing letters to the editor or whatever saying, I live in Colorado, but I visit New England, and, and it would be wonderful. I'd want to come back more often if these forests were protected. That would be great. Um, we have a website, uh, which it's a project of Restore the North Woods. We have a re, uh, Restore website is restore.org. We also have a SaveMassForest.com website, which has sort of basic information on all this stuff. The other thing people can do is sign our petition for a moratorium on logging on, on Massachusetts forests. It's not a legal document, so you don't have to be a Massachusetts resident. So we want to just, in fact, showing pe that people from other places think these are important for us. That would be really good. In terms of the whole Northwoods, we are we have – our new national parks project, um, and and we really we just don't have enough horsepower to do everything. But we, there are a lot of places around the country. We have a list of a hundred areas that could qualify as national park. And every state, there's there's at least one area in every single state. And we we want to get people around the country fired up to do that because uh, that could save millions and millions of acres of land by turning them into national parks. Well. Thank you so much for your work in the world. Thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Michael Kellett. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.